Friends on my radio to help me get through. To fill your head full of figures, your heart full of pride, you're all on the road. You're never driven for that.
I get my groove and swagger on, blasting out my favorite song. Let my freaky out, let it show. Let it show. Ain't nothing wrong with confidence, loving me, I'm feeling it. Let the rhythm move and let go. Cause I get high and low, yeah, dust it up and shake it up. High and low, yeah, dust it up and shake it up. Don't matter what they say, I'ma, I'ma do my thing, I'ma, I'ma do my thing. Just watch me. I'ma do my thing, yeah, I'ma do my thing, yeah, I'ma do my thing, yeah. Just watch me. I'ma do my thing, yeah, I'ma do my thing, yeah, I'ma do my thing, yeah. Check my nails and look and cry, throw my hair back feeling proud. Baby, I'm on a roll. I'm on a roll. Feel the beat is coming strong. Make me wanna clap along. Feeling good wherever I go. But some days I'm feeling so down and I'm feeling so pretty. But I go on loving myself 'cause I don't need that pretty. 'Cause I get high. Just watch me. I'ma do my thing, yeah. I'ma do my thing, yeah. I'ma do my thing, yeah. Just watch me. I'ma do my thing, yeah. I'ma do my thing, yeah. I'ma do my thing, yeah. High and low, yeah. Dust it off and shake it off. High and low, yeah. Dust it off and shake it off. Don't matter what they say. I'ma, I'ma do my thing. I'ma, I'ma do my thing. Just watch me.
we can start. All right, good evening. I'd like to call the October 12th meeting of the Park and Rec Commission to order. If we could all stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, I hope everyone's doing well. We are down a couple of commissioners, so we can proceed through roll, roll call. Commissioner Olson. Present. Commissioner Munoz. Present. And myself are present. Um, Commissioner Whiting and Commissioner Veretti are not here tonight, but we can move on. Um, do we have any communications from the public? Not seeing any, we will move on to the meeting minutes. We had in our attachment, uh, the July 2nd meeting was not attached, so we can't take a vote on that. But we do have our August 2nd, our special meeting minutes were attached to the agenda, so we can vote on those if, if so moved. One of you has to move. I'll move. You has to second. All right. All right. Do we have approval? We have to do an old-fashioned hand vote because the system is down. So everyone in favor, raise your hand. All right. We'll consider that passed. Okay. Now we can proceed to the youth update. We've got two representatives here, Teen Advisory Council and the Mayor's Youth Council. So let's hear from Ms. Riley, please, from the Teen Advisory Council. Hello, I'm Riley. I'm the Vice President of the Teen Advisory Council. Um, and it's been a minute since I've been here, so pardon me if I'm a bit rusty. But um, some past business, we just had our band book week, which was September 16th through the 21st. So we had a display set up at the Corona Public Library. We had two, actually. One was set up at the Quick Select and one in the children's area. Now, band book week is a program that we put on where we cover up banned or challenged books and put little cue cards in them that um, talk about why they were banned or challenged in schools. That way people can check out those books. It's kind of like um, blind book dating. So they get to check out those books and get more familiar with those sort of difficult topics. So it was a great program, a lot of fun. And then for our upcoming programs, we will be at Halloween weekend this year and we're very excited. So we will be there on October 15th. We will be having a carnival theme booth with booth, sorry, with some prize giveaways. So we look forward to seeing everyone there. And that is all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Riley. Um, Commissioner Olson, do you have anything to add or questions for Ms. Riley? Yeah, I'd just like to add, what, what can I do, what can we do to, to help you and your cause and get more uh, participation and involvement with your program? Um, we love just being able to have our, being able to come to these meetings has definitely helped out a lot. Our um, our analytics actually show that um, from coming to these meetings and being able to kind of broadcast our message out to a wider audience, we've received um, an influx in participation. So now we went from having, I think it was like eight or nine regular kids. We now have 13 regular kids. So very cramped in the Grace Tabor room, but you know, we're having a lot of fun. So just being at these meetings and helping to spread the words. We are also on social media. We do post through the library social media, so you can check us out there. And we have flyers up at um, the library, so you can always check us out there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, and we have the Mayor's Youth Council. You want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. 
Um, hello, my name is Tristan Galvin, and I am from the Mayor's Youth Council. Um, the Mayor's Youth Council offers students the opportunity to serve their community, gain a wealth of experience in local government, and add their voice to discussions that will shape the future of our city. At the September 15th City Council meeting, Mayor Casillas introduced the Mayor's Youth Council, and since then we have had several meetings to plan the town hall with Mayor Casillas, which we will host on Thursday, October 21st at 6 p.m. Um, we are very excited for this opportunity to have the youth speak directly with their electeds and with the mayor and to make their voices heard about changes they would like to see in our city. And our next meeting will be on Tuesday, October 19th, where we will finalize plans for the town hall that you see on the board. Thank you. Any comments? Same question to you. What can we do to uh, help boost engagement with what you're doing? Because I think it's fantastic. Appreciate what you're doing, Tristan. Um, really invite all the youth to come out to the town hall. We are really looking for large support at our town hall, and there will be more opportunities there for the youth to get engaged with their community and learn about the leadership that they can take on and what they can do to engage in the civic process. So make sure they attend that. Thank, Thank you. you. One question from myself is uh, for you is... Uh, how do we go about volunteering as a youth for this uh, town hall meeting? Are they selected by their teachers or counselors at the various schools? Or? Um, no, we will be advertising with specific groups at the schools that we think would be more inclined to come, but it's open to any youth. So any youth across the city, if you want to come and if you're available to come make your voice heard, we encourage you to come just for fun. Or if you um, just want to sit there and you know listen to your elected and get the chance to hear from them too, that's all right as well. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those reports, both of you. Job well done. All right, the next item on our agenda are discussion items. So we have, I should have brought my glasses. We have the director's report. And I assume Abby. Oh, there we go. Okay. I pushed the button too hard and it went on and then off. <laughs> So good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'm Abby Lenning. I'm here for uh, Dr. Ann Turner this evening. I'm the Assistant Director of Community Services. And I'll be going, thank you. I will be giving you some updates. It's been an exciting couple of weeks for the Community Services Department with so much going on. I wanted to make sure I introduce a new face that has started with us before I go into my report. Ruby Vargas is our new administrative assistant and she has been valiantly getting us going this evening. Uh, she's been with our department since August and has really hit the ground running. She will be staffing the commission meetings with us and tonight is her first night doing this all on her own. So. Thank you, Ruby, and without further ado, let's get going. So fall workshop recap. On Wednesday, September 29th, the city held a fall workshop where we, the community service department, took three items. We gave an informational overview of the community tree planting volunteer program. We also presented a timeline for the Trails Master Plan, the second phase of that. And we presented on how to expand access to the Corona Public Library's Heritage Room collection. We will be moving forward with all three of these items and we'll be exploring different options for the expanded access to the library's Heritage Room collection. This will include a review of the Heritage Room's policies and procedures, and we anticipate bringing this back to council with some proposals at the beginning of 2022. Hollow Weekend was mentioned by Riley. Um, so it's going to be a busy couple of weeks coming up. Hollow Weekend is this weekend. We invite you all to come join our team for some spooky fun starting October 15th through the 17th. The Wicked Fun starts on Friday, October 15th, and uh, with Escape Room Experiences by OBC Theater at our Historic Civic Center. Grab your tickets online at www.obctheater.com and see if you have what it takes. Our management team participated in one of these escape rooms not too long ago. It was really fun. We barely made it out. On Saturday evening, on the 16th from 5 to 8, join us for some Halloween fun right here at the South Lawn with goodies and treats for our treat trail, followed by a viewing of Frankenweenie, rated PG at 
And not too far in the distance after Halloween, our team will be preparing for our annual holiday lighting celebration on the front lawn of the Historic Civic Center with the always exciting highlight of the evening, the ceremonial lighting of the Historic Civic Center complex to launch us into the holiday season with the city of Corona. And you can see that's scheduled for December 5th. I just turned it off. Ah, look at that. There we go. Cleanup schedule. Uh, so the Good Clean Fund continues with our Corona Beautiful community cleanup volunteer opportunities. We have two upcoming Corona Beautiful events, one at Griffin Park on Saturday, October 23rd from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And the second one will be along the 15 freeway from Magnolia to Ontario on Saturday, November 13th from 9 to 12. Those we would like to see 16 years and older at that one. And for more information, our volunteer program coordinator is available, Maddie Black, at 951-736-2241. And she will make sure you have all the information you need about those community cleanups. Those have been really successful and fun to participate in. Grady, uh, graffiti abatement update. Uh, GPC, our new graffiti contractor, has been providing abatement services since January. They have one to two crews in town daily and have been removing graffiti in 48 to 72 hours. They provide color match services as well as power watching. And this has helped our staff by allowing the park maintenance staff to focus on deferred maintenance items as well as provide better services to our park patrons. Additionally, this Thursday, October 14th, the city in partnership with Skate Park Respect and Liquid Death Mountain Water are hosting the Santana Park Teen Volunteer Cleanup at Santana Park Skate Park at 4 p.m. Come join us in showing your Corona hometown pride by volunteering with us in cleaning up our skate park. For a park ranger update, uh, we have two part-time park rangers who are currently providing additional presence in the parks, trails, and open spaces around the city. Staff is working in rotating shifts that include nights and weekends. And currently, we have five staff members sign up to be PC832 trained, where they will enforce park rules and hours. A big thank you to our Corona PD for collaborating with us to get staff fully trained. And interviews took place last week for both part-time and full-time rangers. So we hope to have some more of those rangers on board pretty soon. Park reopening process. Um, tomorrow at the um, Committee of the Whole, our team will be taking the Mountain Gate Park Playground reopening update to the council. We'll presenting, we will be presenting on the park reopening process for when we have these reopenings, like that of Mountain Gate Park Playground. We are still working on some prospective dates. As of right now, we are looking at Wednesday, October 20th or the 27th, and we will keep you updated as we finalize these dates. And that's all I have, unless there are any questions. Commissioners, do you have any questions or comments? Commissioner Olson? I do have a couple, uh, and I'll just kind of go through them in order. For the uh, OBC Theater Escape Room, do we know what ages that would be appropriate for? I believe it's an all-age event, Jason. Is that correct? Um, I actually they ha I believe they have it posted on the website as nine or older. It does skew a little bit on the spooky side, so I would use your best judgment in terms of uh, the child um, and what they're comfortable with. Great. Um, as far as the cleanups, I had a couple of questions about those. For Griffin Park, you know, community might ask, that's a brand new park. What are we cleaning up? Well, what we usually do is Moses and his team, they will assess the park as it's getting close to that date to see what needs might be happening. And we did have a reopening there with the dog park, but there were still other elements of that park that need attention as it gets used. Fantastic, and, the, and can we de describe what the 15 cleanup activities might be? Are they like actually on the Caltrans type areas of the, of the 15 corridor? You know what, I don't have details on that. I can certainly get them to you all so you know exactly what's going to be happening there for that. Excellent. Um, awesome on the graffiti abatement, um, noticing it all over town. Everything is, is disappearing much, much more quickly, and that certainly is appreciated throughout the community. Um, with the park rangers, when it is fully staffed in December, what could the 
average community member expect in terms of presence for the rangers at those parks? Well, what they do is they will be, as we have more of those staff, we will have them assigned to certain regions so they really get to know those areas and those parks. And so what the hope is, is that with more communication with the community, they will be educating community on here's how we use our parks, here's how we can report problems that we see, and then overall keep you know, keep graffiti abated, be that presence that can help those stay up to speed and hopefully notice problems before they become bigger problems and we can address them more quickly. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, thank you. On the uh, fall workshop recap, what was involved in the extent of the work that the volunteers put into tree planting? Were they digging holes or? Well, um, you know what? I have not seen that full report that day. Um, Jason, do you have more information on the volunteer tree program? Uh, you know, I do not have that with me, but I'd be glad to gather that information and make that available to you. Uh, the full report is available. Thank you. I do know, Tom, that after we ha held the Jameson tree planting, we did make some adjustments to how, because that was a very labor-intensive day for all those volunteers. So I know we did do some revamping to it. So um, our staff would do a little bit of prep ahead of time. Um, but I can't speak to all the details that were presented that day. My last question is on the uh, park ranchers being trained by, our staff being trained by the PD. And what's involved with that, for one thing? And two, can a commissioner be volunteer to take part in that training program to get an idea, a grasp of what's involved with that? For I can certainly find out if commissioners can be involved in that training. What it does is it allows the rangers to have some more authority to cite when they see that code is being uh, broken in our parks. All right. Thank you. Um, could you please just list the uh, time and place for the hollow weekend exactly? I, we didn't say the time, and are we still doing it between the two city halls? They, it will be on the South Lawn, mm -hmm. and on Saturday it will be from 5 to 8 mm -hmm. for the treat trail, and the movie itself is at 6.30. And do you have the OBC Theater... Yes, Times. OBC Theater is going to be running actually for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, because the escape room is limited in terms of how many participants they can take at a time, they're taking essentially pods or uh, groups that register um, in certain time slots. So we'll have a reserved time for that. Um, but you can sign up for that uh, through the website. Um, it'll let you know all the availability there. Um, again, that's a really cool program. I do encourage our residents to take it out. It is ticketed, but it is so much fun. And OBC always does an over-the-top production. I mean, theater quality production every time. They're amazing at what they do. Okay, thank you. And then um, I did have a question about you were going to the Committee of the Whole for the process for reopening parks. Could you give me a little detail about what do you mean by process for reopening the park? Well, Jason's going to be presenting that tomorrow. Could you um, give a little preview? I'd be happy to, Ms. Lenning. Uh, so what we are looking at essentially is just uh, bringing forward what our process is for like playground or amenity reopenings. It's not necessarily that we're reopening a whole entire park. Uh, so in these instances, what we like to do is kind of like a ceremonial, um, you know, just a quick ribbon cutting, a photo op um, with our local dignitaries as well as community members who would like to join us for that experience. Uh, we try to time it, you know, when park users are um, actually out there, um, when it's convenient, of course, for the dignitaries. But the real purpose is to make sure our residents are aware uh, that the amenity has reopened to the public. A lot of folks have been watching the site, watching all the progress, seeing the mammoth come in was absolutely amazing. And they're ready to get out there and play. So we want to get them out as uh, quickly as possible there. So really, you know, in terms of policies, all that, it's not so much policy, but, you know, we just want to get feedback. You know, this is what we're planning on doing. Um, if there's any additional things or, um, you know, questions you have regarding um, how we reopen amenities, we'd, of course, be open to feedback, you know, here in this forum or, of course, at the community as a whole. Um, we're always trying to work with the community here. Okay. So you were basically going to talk about, is it better to open on a Saturday or is it better to open on a weekday after school? These are the kind of ideas that you were going to go through in this park process opening? Yeah. So traditionally what we would do is um, a Wednesday afternoon, we kind of always tied them with um, the council meetings, uh, the sense that tends to work better for uh, scheduling. Uh, but we're open to any day, time of the day. Um, we just really want to hear back uh, from uh, the folks, you know, 
what means the most to them. In many cases, our residents just want to see the amenity open as quickly as possible. So we kind of factor that into um, the site should be live um, once it's signed off from um, inspection fairly soon here. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all that I have. So if there's no more questions, there was no public comment cards for this item. So I think we can move on to the next item if we're done. All righty. All right. Uh, the next item is park equipment standards. And that's item number three. Ms. Good Martin. evening. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Tonight we'd like to uh, discuss with you some park equipment standards that we've been working on. I always go the wrong way. Um, Really, the intent is as we work towards uh, replacing equipment that we have identified over the past year or so during our park and facility inventory, as we start to do that replacement process, we don't want to just put back in what's already there and may not be working properly. What we want to do is we want to get some feedback from, you know, not just our parks maintenance staff, who we kind of ran things by, but also from end users and commissioners just to make sure that we have appropriate equipment. Um, explore options for maybe more organic materials in some cases versus the heavy concrete benches may not be appropriate in some of our neighborhood parks. And so we really just wanted to kind of uh, have that conversation, what, what fits with the community, you know, what's going to enhance our parks and, and be durable and last because unfortunately sometimes equipment um, you know, starts out looking great but then maybe after a little bit of use it, it doesn't work out so well. So we want to make sure we're taking all those considerations in. Um, and really tonight, um, what I did do or is we're going to seek your feedback and I've provided you with the survey and I, I don't expect you to make snap decisions tonight. What I'd really like is um, these are just options that we can kind of run through real quick for various uh, pieces of equipment. And I'd like you to take this home, you know, and give us your thoughtful feedback if you want, you know, if you have other people you'd like to, to discuss or maybe go out to some of our sites and take a look and see how things are faring. Um, that's fantastic. You have this to be able to provide some feedback, rank things for us. And then what we'll do is we'll try to bring this back to you guys in the next month or two and say, okay, this is what we kind of have settled on. You know, maybe if there's some areas that we, we missed, we need to do some more research on. Um, but really, you know, the goal is to kind of standardize, but then provide one or two options perhaps for different areas. You know, uh, border park, a lot of beautiful pine trees, grass settings, plopping a big concrete bench there probably isn't the best thing for it. So we need your feedback to help us see how, how these parks, what the culture is going to look like, what, what is it going to be. Um, and with that, I'm just going to run through these real quickly. If you have any questions regarding any of the equipment, we put the pricing down there because that's always a consideration as well. You know, there's some really great equipment out there, but how much do you want to spend versus what you get? So we just wanted you guys to have that information. And again, um, if you can turn this in to us by the next commission meeting, that would be fantastic. You're always welcome to do it sooner, but I don't want to impose upon you and your busy schedules. Um, but we're just looking for that feedback. What do you like the most? Tell us why. What did you like about it? Um, you like the material or you've seen maybe in a park, you know, we have these, they don't work well. Let's look for something else. Uh, provide that feedback so that we can make sure that we're serving the community and providing the amenities that are going to last and that um, are desired. And with that, just fast forward. Um, I will stop a little bit on the signage now. Um, Signage is very open to interpretation, right? There's a lot of feedback that you can provide. I understand um, some people may have a different approach uh, with signage, but really what we want to do is get your feedback on uh, what, what's the appropriate kind of signage. What's the tone that you want us to take when we put the signage out? Are we going to be very regulatory? The CMC says this. Is it going to be more of a conversational item? Are we going to have you know, Spanish and English? What do we need to, to provide? What's the tone that we really want to set with the parks and the culture? Um, so while these may not be examples that we use, you may not even like any of these, but what we'd like you to do is tell us what you like about it. Tell us what things you don't like. If there's a park that you know of that you've seen that you, you really like the signage or the style, let us know so that we can kind of formulate what that's going to look like for our city. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. 
Commissioner Wilson, do you have any questions? Yeah, just a couple. I think it's uh, fantastic to have the opportunity to offer feedback on this. We're calling it standards, um, but you gave a great example, like Border Park, lovely pine trees, maybe a particular bench doesn't work there, but is a great fit somewhere else. So were we talking maybe a couple different standards for different types of parks? Correct. So, you know, we might have more of the industrial heavy duty things that would go and be appropriate at some of our uh, community parks, the large parks. But then at our small neighborhood parks, you know, we definitely want something else or other options. So um, that's definitely part of the discussion is we don't want to have too many because that becomes a maintenance nightmare. But what do we think would be, you know, versatile? Do we want to go more of a natural elements or do we want to stick with, you know, metal benches or something else that's, um, you know, that works just as well? Okay, great. Um, and in terms of like the water fountains, for instance, one of them has a nice bottle filler, which is cool. Do we have any sort of idea as to how often those things actually get used? Same thing with the barbecues. You know, if they're getting used all the time, maybe it's worth getting the more grand type. Yeah, that's not something I can really speak to about the use of, of the bottle fillers. Um, I, I think that's really... Um, a question we can look into and, and provide more feedback. Yeah, I was going to mention, Tracy, one way we can probably look at that, too, is uh, looking at how often we have to change the filters out on that. It would take a little bit of investigation, but I think that would provide us with some really good quantitative data. Yeah, Sure. We can check with our parks, uh, you know, maintenance staff on that to see. Um, the barbecues, I know that's even a question of, you know, do we want barbecues at all of the parks anymore? Maybe they're appropriate at some, and we put in some heavy-duty ones, like that concrete one you see there at the community parks, or not, you know, at the larger parks, and maybe, you know, most people are bringing their own. You know, do we allow that? I mean, that's that's kind of even a conversation piece for, for that's up for grabs. Thank you. Mr. Munoz, do you have anything to add? I do, thank you. First of all, I applaud you for all the work and research you put into this endeavor and uh, for offering Corona, the community, some standards to work with. I know that uh, as a designer, uh, it takes a lot of time. It's, it's a big investment on your part for the community. But I'm wondering, though, if in our office, what we do, our owner wants us to basically say, and right now we're in a process, or have been in the process, of looking at other parks and what's been done before by other designers. You know, what makes us go to their parks to see what they do? And so we've come away with that and doing our own designs for a variety of different uh, parks and other playgrounds and such. And so now what we want to do is have them come, people come to our parks to see what did that office do that's so exciting? What's so iconic about that park that makes it and worth talking about, and you go home and you even dream about it too, possibly. Who knows? I'm a crazy guy. So anyway, what can Corona do to make our parks more exciting? And then people come to our parks from other cities and say, Corona has hit the mark, the, the target right on the head, you know, with their benches, their signs, their drinking fountains, and so forth and so on. If we can do that, if we can spend more time in there, I'd love to volunteer to help with the quick presentation on what we could do possibly. i work with you and Moses on that if you want there. Uh, but it'll be fun to do that, you know, just to make our, our, our city proud to be in. For example, I'm in the process of looking for a new house, a new house right now. So I told my wife, you know, I said, Paula, we need to have a house that if it has personality. It has flavor to it. You know, it, it, it speaks to me. And so when we have play equipment, too, that speaks to the community in that particular area, then you hit, you hit a home run. More importantly, if you hit the whole genre of side amenities, then you really hit a, a, a great, you just hit a home run again. And so a grand slam, so to speak. So I think we need to do that. And I think the commissioners would love to help you on that endeavor, too. I'm volunteering my friends over here. <laughs> but it'd be nice to even talk about that, you know, at the very least, a, a discussion about that process. And you already have it down packed, so I'm, not, I'm speaking to the choir here, and, and you're great at what you do. But I like to put a little bit more effort into, on my part to help you help us do that more, that, that go an extra smile, extra step. So the people come to us and say, they hit a home run again. And that's a great point, and I really appreciate that and, and your comments and uh, offer of help. And, and there's a lot to be discussed in terms of do we want to stay with the, uh, I call it like the Disneyland type of a, the trash can, you know, and everything, it's all the same color at all of our parks and very uniform. 
Do we want to use color to help with that character, you know, and kind of define that, make things pop? We did put in some, you know, with the bike racks, um, some things that maybe were a little bit different. You know, you have a leaf shape or you have a bicycle shape, you know. There's some character like that that we can bring in. Um, so really that's kind of, that's, that's where we're starting the conversation, you know. Do we want the functionality or do we want to make more of a statement with it? So we tried where we could to provide some of those options to you. Okay, so that's that's kind of where I was going to go. I'm I'm trying to figure out what kind of feedback to give you based on kind of the grid system because I was looking at these items in terms of um, usability. How easily are they to clean? Uh, how easily are they to maintain to get into to get the trash out or? Um, like even the barbecue grills, for example, the big one that's the concrete, you know, that example is only at El Cerrito Park and we just have the one. I'm not sure that that's that heavily used. Um, I know that, you know, the maintenance there is that the uh, stainless steel doors are constantly getting broken and, you know, it's an expense and it's like, is it usable? Once those doors get broken, it's expense to fix, then is it usable after that? It's even got like a rotisserie type of thing that you, you crank the roller and it just goes up and down. It's a very complicated system and I look at that and I think I would never bother to use this. Like I know the idea was probably we'll have big team events because it's a large sports park and we can have that kind of grilling. But I just, being someone that was there five days a week for several years, it, I never saw it. And you know, so that was the kind of thing that I, I don't, I want to be able to give you better feedback than ranking one to four. Are you looking for that kind of discussion, or are we going to have that type of discussion using this example as a later date as a commission? I think that's part of the feedback we'd like. You know, if if barbecue grills are not, it's kind of a trend, right? You know, if we go and we look at, well, tennis was very popular, and it still is, but now we have a different following with pickleball, and our, we have to adjust our standards to what the trend is or to what's, you know, what the community wants or needs. So I think that's an appropriate comment to make and something that we would appreciate to, to receive. If you don't think it's something that we really need in our parks, you don't see that it's used, make that comment because that will affect, you know, how we program and how we, do we replace or do we just remove as, okay. as things age? I think that as a commission, we probably need more information on each one of these items because I'll just use example B on the trash cans. I can't tell what kind of material that is around that trash can uh, or if that's for hot coals. I assume it's for hot coals, but then there's like a container for an aluminum trash can. So I can't really figure out what's what and as far as the um, materials go. The same, I was having the same issue with the benches. Um, when you flip over to the picnic table section, um, right, table A, I don't know if that's concrete or some kind of resin. Table B, I think, think, it's probably the type of tables we have now with the wire mesh with the uh, coating on it that wears off. Um, my question then would be, is for it, so this is where I'm struggling. Is A even concrete or resin? And is is B what existing that we have? And C is, I would assume, it's what I see in other cities. It's some kind of metal coated with like a almost like a soft vinyl type of, I don't know what it is. It's some kind of epoxy. And then D looks like a metal, but I still, I can't tell what kind of um, material it is. So I'm having trouble... I'm not going to be able to give you feedback if I can't figure out uh, the picnic tables. And then I have the corresponding issue with the benches. I can't tell what A is. If that's wood or a resin, I would assume it's some kind of resin material. I can definitely add that material information to the survey and resend it out to all of you so that you have that. We also, um, you know, there's obviously websites where we researched and got this information from. So if that's information that's, you know, of interest to you, but we can add some more detail to this so that you could help to help you make a decision. I think it might help because, and, I, and it might help you. I don't know. You can let me know. But um, for instance, if you're not familiar, not all the ta not all the picnic tables have, uh, all the parks have picnic table B in them, but I know where the, they're at, so you could go look at them, that type of thing. 
It's if you if the commissioners were interested to go look at examples of some of the things that are in here, it might be helpful to know, you know, where they're at. Drinking Fountain A is, you know, at Santana, Eagle Glen type of thing. So is Drinking Fountain B. Um, drinking Fountain E, we don't even have. So I, I think that might help the commission if you add in that. Also, oh, Drinking Fountain C, again, I think we need to get into the materials because I'm thinking like at El Cerrito, Drinking Fountain C looks like the drinking fountains that are at El Cerrito Park, but they have almost like a pebble tech kind of coating on them or, or concrete with pebbles. And so I think I need that because I can't tell if that's just like tan, metals painted tan or if that's some kind of material on the outside. And I think if we're moving towards some kind of a standard, um, I'd like to know exactly you know what it is I'm looking at and what it's made out of. Um, and the signs, can I, I wanted to move on to that. I am not sure what you're asking for the signs because I think, didn't we get signs at almost every park in example A already? That is our basic park rule sign, but as you can see from some of the examples, I think- Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Monument entry signs, not rule signage, sorry. Right after the drinking fountains, yeah. There you go. There we go. So Those are I was asking, isn't that already at the majority of parks? They are. They yeah. are. But that's another question. You know, um, I think in some cases, uh, it's not in all of the parks, but in some of the parks, is that an appropriate sign? You've got this really big monolith concrete sign. Is that what we want at all of our parks going forward? Do we want more of a natural look to it? Do we want to make it more of a Corona standard sign where people, they know they're in the city of Corona, you know, and it's really embodies more of the personality of the city versus this big concrete monolith. Um, there's a couple of the smaller parks that that, that sign really eclipses everything there. Does that right. go with the, the feeling or with the, the theme that we want at all of our parks? Okay, so this is kind of where, so are we, have, are we having the discussion where we really talk about we want to have different signs at different parks? Correct. Because Prior, it was all the signs are the same at all of the parks. So that's, is that the direction we're going in? We'd like to have a couple of options for the monument signs, and it goes along with the, is it appropriate for the, the size and the use of the park? Maybe at a large community park where, you know, we do expect outside visitors from other cities coming for baseball games or things like that, soccer, maybe that large concrete you know, monolith sign is very appropriate, you know, and it, it's very uh, uh, majestic there, and it says this is the city of Corona. Maybe for some of our smaller parks, the neighborhood parks, uh, something more like the boulder sign or something that's more wood or more rustic with more natural materials is more appropriate. Okay. And we, we'd like to have not just one standard, but really, like I said, a couple of different options for each piece of equipment because of that very nature. We have some very large parks, high usage. You really do need something that's gonna, you know, concrete, that's gonna last. Um, but some of, some of the smaller neighborhood parks, that might be too much. So what direction do we wanna go in? Okay, so, so the commission is clear. We're not just um, ranking, you know, best to worst then. So we're gonna be, Adding, I think it might be helpful if maybe we go through and as commissioners put in our um, ideas for discussion points on these items. So, for example, the signs would be, do they need to be at every park? Is it appropriate? And um, do we want to standardize it across all parks? Like, that would be the discussion points. Maybe if you guys, if we all sit and, and talk about, and think about that in terms of what do we want to bring back to discuss that might make this go a little easier as a commission. I think the staff is looking for some flexibility in what they're doing, and I think we are too. I think uh, that I certainly can't, can look at even you know the trash cans that, that don't move that are cement look appropriate for Santana Park but don't look appropriate for a small park. We can get we can understand that so that might be a discussion point. And same with the rule signs. Um, 
you know, I looked at these signs and I thought, okay, it's great that some of these signs are pictures, very simple to understand, you know, no dogs, no bikes, no skateboards, whatever it says there. That makes sense. And then these signs that have a long and have a ton of rules on them, maybe a discussion point would be maybe we do need to have the rules posted at every park, but these little smaller signs make a lot of sense. So perhaps if we come back with those ideas, we can then give them more feedback on the items that they're looking for instead of, because it was a little confusing because I was looking at this. It's almost like a, um, you're asking me which one I like best, right? And I don't think that's where we're going. We're looking at which one do we like best for maybe which opportunity for placement on there's, top of that. There's, it's it's, that, and there's I know a standard, but it's it's also where is it going to go. Yeah, and, and, and the signs too, I mean, that's a very difficult one, and I, I can appreciate you saying, you know, wanting some more information on, on what we were looking for. I think one of the things that I, I know personally if I go and I see 20 different signs at a place, all of a sudden you stop reading them. So, you know, what's going to be the most effective? What's the best tone to use? You know, and that's really more of, I think, part of what this discussion is about signage. You know, how, what's our tone at the parks? Is it, you know, hey, if you do this, bad things are going to happen. Is it more of a conversational, please? You know, we ask that you, you know, these are the rules at the park. Instead of saying rules, maybe this is the expected behavior. You know, there's a different tone that we can take uh, with, our, with our signage and, do we want to have a sign for every little don't do this, don't do that? Or do we want to kind of try to have those pictures, a little bit more friendly type of information and you know, QR codes to help guide people to maybe more extensive rules? And if I may, to, um, to your point, we are looking for a kind of a starting point you know, that we'll come back to you guys with. We do want to, we were appropriate some funding for the first couple of years of replacing park equipment. So we do want to start kind of moving forward on that. But knowing that the park master plan is coming up, this is going to kind of give us some some feedback that we can use in that and then formalize these where we use something, you know, where we use a trash can that's concrete, this is the most appropriate place for it. Where we use something that's more of metal or wood, you know, this is the most appropriate type of park that we use. And we'll incorporate that into that plan. Okay. Any more questions for that? generate for you, either one of you? Good. You're good? Okay. All right. Thank you so much for your report. And uh, we can move on, seeing that there are no comment cards from the public. We can go on to our next item for discussion, which are playground shade options. This has been a very important uh, want and need from the community. So let's see what we have. Is that you again? That's me again. Okay. Good evening, I guess. So tonight what we want to do is bring forward some information to share with you. We did some research on, of course, uh, what our portfolio is, what best practices are, and maybe some strategies that we can utilize for uh, the city going forward as we you know, maintain our existing playgrounds and, and we're showing you replace them as they approach the end of their 25 year uh, roughly useful life. Um, and we want to get that feedback so that we can form some uh, recommendations for city council. So we would like to get your input on what types of coverage you want to see. What kind of timeline do you want to see when we implement these? We can be very aggressive or is it going to be a little bit slower paced? Those affect budget. Um, and what kind of future guidelines do we want to incorporate when we are replacing playgrounds? I always think of the George Harrison song when I see that. So here comes the sun. Um, we know there's many benefits, but there's also some bad things, of course, uh, that we're all familiar with or experienced. Um, you know, negative effects of sun. I don't need to tell you all this, but of course, it not only harms our skin, but it can have negative effects on equipment. It can prematurely age it, just like ourselves, uh, harden plastics, uh, and it just becomes worn down and doesn't last as long as it should. And additionally, because we do have, um, you know, we've paved everything, we've got roads everywhere, uh, maybe we don't have some, as many trees as we need to, those effects of the sun can be compounded. Um, we can create that heat island effect, warms things up, and that's definitely not where we want our playgrounds to be located. This is just a picture of one of our parks. And even just 
the exposure um, that equipment has, the way it faces. This is the same playground equipment. And you can see just from the western exposure, okay, that, play, you know, that slide looks great. But the eastern exposure where it's facing the sun all day long, oh man, it's, it looks like a totally different piece of equipment. So that sun just definitely can have a huge impact. This is just some information that we gathered on the climate in different parts of the country. And as you can see, with 95 days over 90 degrees here in Riverside uh, County, that's basically one every four days that it's probably too hot for someone to play, play outside without there having some shade nearby. Um, and even though you know San Diego is not that far away, boy, what a big difference in the climate. So we definitely can't just look to some of the, the neighbors in Southern California, but maybe need to look at some other uh, cities that are more closely linked to ours weather-wise. This is an inventory that we did of our playgrounds and the types of shade that we have. And what we looked at was how many playgrounds do we have with the full shade canopy? Um, how many have a larger canopy and some large established trees nearby? And then the other ones that we classify as having really no structure, no shade structure or trees nearby. Um, and so as you can see, you know, not too bad, about 40% of them have some type of shade structure surrounding but we still have a majority that do not. Um, we don't have any playgrounds at this time that have shade, a complete shade structure. Best practices um, for playgrounds, we definitely wanna make sure that we're offering a suitable environmental con conditions for our children. So that's you know, making sure that there's proper coverage, shade nearby. Um, and in order to do that, some of the recommendations are to have any metal equipment under direct shade, right? We want to make sure that's not in the sun where it can't get um, heated up. And we also want to make sure that we provide shade nearby so that when kids are playing outside, they do have an opportunity. And we can't shade them all the time, but give them an opportunity to have a place to go rest so that they can cool down before they go back to playing nearby. So these are some of the best practices that we need to make sure that we're implementing when we do put in playgrounds and playground equipment. As part of the recently adopted strategic plan, we know that it's important for us to meet the goals of the community. And that's definitely making sure that we have great equipment, that uh, <laughs> we are enhancing the experience for our residents. People know they can take their kids to the park. It's safe, it's clean, their shade, you know, it's a comfortable, nice experience for everybody. We know parks are important to people. We know during COVID, people had limited options. They came to our parks. And I think that really manifested itself in that strategic plan. Parks are important and we need to invest in those. So over the past several years, we've been doing some survey information as we've installed new playgrounds. So when we installed the playground or we were getting feedback on the design for Lincoln Park, we put out a survey. Now, when I did a word count through those surveys responses, just about every response mentioned shade, hot, or heat. We know that's important to everybody. Um, and every time we post anything about playgrounds, these are the types of comments we get. They're happy to get new equipment, but the next thing is always, what about shade? What about shade? This is great, what about shade? So we know it's definitely a priority for the community. So what we did is we explored different options for four of our playgrounds. And what we'd like to do is kind of show you what we were thinking, um, different options, different costs associated with those, and get your feedback on what you think is most appropriate. So we have the situation, which I think most people would like, which is 100% shade. We want to cover everything, have that um, artificial shade mechanism over it so you know it's always shaded. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to all of these options. Um, with the shade structures, it's a little bit higher cost. Um, I think as we pointed out, um, sometimes it doesn't shade every place that you want. You know, depending on where the sun is, you may have this false sense of, uh, of coverage, but um, it does help. Um, but there's higher replacement costs. Uh, maintenance and vandalism concerns. So there's pros and there's cons to that. Trees. 
Um, trees add a very natural aesthetic. It helps cool, cool down the whole area. A little bit lower cost. It's definitely in line with our urban forest management plan. You know, we definitely want to add some more trees to our parks. Um, may not be the most effective coverage. Um, there's also leaves and debris that can get, you know, on the playground and equipment. Um, and then there's a combination of the two. That last picture is actually Surface Club Park. And I think that was a really great example where you have an equipment, you know, piece of equipment, has a large shade structure kind of built into it. There's a lot of large established trees around. It's a nice, cool environment. You know, it's where you want to take your kid. There's shade you can sit down, enjoy. They have a place to, to play in the shade as well. Um, so you get kind of the best of both worlds. These are some mock-ups that we got from um, a shade manufacturer and some costs. Um, as you can see, it's, it's more expensive, I think, as we go through the other slides, for the artificial shade structure. Uh, Lincoln Park in particular, there are a lot of large oak trees that are right near the park playground. So even if we were to put in a whole shade structure, we would have to, I wouldn't even want to say it, take out the oak trees, because that would be a, a, definitely a no-no. Or we'd have to shift the structure so far you know, to the left or uh, over the side of it that may not be as effective or worth the money to do. Mountain Gate Park is a smaller playground. That was actually a very cost-effective, um, as you'll see on some later slides, for getting a shade structure over that. Uh, particular park playground and village park which is uh, a circle <laughs> so we uh, went with a nice little octagon there um, the playgrounds Lincoln Park's the largest one you know, at the 6,500 square feet but you know we're talking four to five thousand square feet that we're trying to to cover with the shade structure um, costs range between 20 to 40 dollars per, per square foot um, and the cost can be Lincoln Park was close to $250,000 if we want to shade that entire playground. There's limitations as well with the height of the, the playground equipment that have to be considered. The next item is, is um, trees only option. Um, we could install various types of trees, uh, sizes of trees between 48 inch box or very well established 84 inch box tree. Uh, nearby some of the playgrounds. Um, as you know, shade probably wouldn't be as effective, if, of course, as a, an artificial straight shade structure, but there would be, definitely be added benefits to it um, in terms of cooling down the area surrounding it, providing shade to parents that might be sitting on benches nearby. And this is really one of the least uh, expensive methods. And then lastly, we kind of looked at a combination option. Right, where we're targeting with shade structures over maybe those playground elements that might get the hottest, you know, anything that has metal on it, platforms. And then we also added in trees because it does have that cooling effect. Some playgrounds we've been to um, where there's these nice established trees around, it's very cool. There are some that surprisingly have no trees around and you feel it within a few minutes that it's not very pleasant. Um, this type of an option, if you can see, and I apologize if the graphics aren't that great, but on the, the left we have Lincoln Park. We would put two small shade structures over the pieces of equipment that tend to be the hottest. They're not made of wood. They have metal on them. And then put some other trees around the other side of it to kind of help cool off the area. Um, there's a couple benches out there for parents to sit on. This would help provide some shade for that as well. Still keep it nice and open. Um, and the same thing with Santana Park. Santana Park's a nice uh, moon-shaped, crescent-shaped <laughs> playground. So it would be very difficult and expensive to cover that 100% with a shade structure. So we had some options where we were putting a couple of shade structures over targeted pieces of equipment and then just adding a couple of trees around the, the edges to kind of help add that shade and cooling effect. So moving forward, what we'd like to discuss with you tonight is get some feedback from you on what your preference is. Um, we have, we can go with the structure only, and that's going to be our policy. Um, it's going to be a little bit more expensive if we go that route. Um, if we went with trees only, that could cause some problems. It's not quite as effective, but it definitely would help and add to a good aesthetic of a park. 
And then lastly, it would be kind of a combination option that we discussed in that last slide, where we target certain pieces of equipment that are most likely to get hottest, but still add some shade uh, by adding natural trees around. Uh, so what we'd like to hear from you is what your preference is based on what you've heard from the community, what you think is most appropriate for our playgrounds, so that we can come back and develop a policy that we can bring back to you, that we can make those recommendations to council. Um, along with deciding the types of coverage that we're looking at, the types of, I guess, personality that you would say for our parks, um, would be what type of a timeline did you want to uh, look at? Do we want to be very aggressive and try to do 10 playgrounds a year, a very aggressive schedule, or maybe do something a little bit lower, or just do it as playgrounds come and are replaced? Um, and again, so what we'd like to do is hear from you now. Um, we'll take this information, formulate a policy, uh, bring it back to you guys for your approval. And once we do that, we would set an appropriate budget, we would make a request from council, and we would move forward. This is just the, the policy that we would go, we would formalize your rec recommendations, develop a policy, present it to the committee of the whole, and make an appropriate budget request. Okay. Um, <coughs> Commissioner Olson, do you have any comments? I do. I've got a few comments and a couple questions. Um, first, thank you. This, as a parent of a two year old, I'm an expert on the subject. Um, you know, uh, both for the toddler and myself, and you made a good point in there that you know, companions are often overlooked when it comes to shade. Um, we've got a brand new park up in Sierra Bella, beautiful park. There's no shade structures, there are some immature trees, uh, but there's benches, and it, the parents being comfortable is just as important um, as the kids being comfortable as well. So uh, my personal preference, you know, if I look at a park that I think just kind of works today, it's Surface Club Park. Um, it's got some partial shade structures targeted over the play equipment, and it's got trees, mature trees, in the right spots. They're on the south-facing side of the park that blocks the sun most of the day. So not just having trees, but putting them in the right spots is going to matter a lot. Um, obviously, they take time. My gut instinct is to prefer the combination type of approach um, and targeting things that kids sit on. Right? My kid loves swing slides and rockers and all those things. If she's wearing shorts on a hot day, she ends up hating that thing. Right? She gets afraid of, of, uh, of those things. So um, those things, I think, would be the most important, not necessarily where a kid's just running around, but where they make contact with it uh, when they're seated on it especially. Um, I actually kind of like, you know, for the larger play structures on this slide right here, um, the one on the left, you know, as opposed to this big monolithic canopy covering the entire park, something kind of broken up looks a little bit more organic, even though it's definitely not, but it, it looks a little bit more purposeful in that it belongs there and it adds to a little bit of the whimsy of the park itself as opposed to just being a, a canopy over the entire thing. I do think aesthetics matter when it comes to a park. Um, you know, so it is definitely a balance between overall practicality and, and, and how it looks and how, it's, how attractive it is to, to draw people in. Um, maintenance is a big thing for me. Obviously, if we put something in, it's got to be something that's going to last a long time and, and still look good. You know, do we put something that's bright red and it turns kind of a pale pink over time, right? Kind of gets that powdery red look. Um, so that's something that we want to take a look at. Um, in terms of the moderate to aggressive approach to it, this is where my question is. How would we prioritize that? If we said, you know, we want to really go after this and do all the parks that don't have shade, obviously the ones that don't have shade would be prioritized, but among them, how would we prioritize them? That's a great question. I, I think it would be in terms of the, the playgrounds that have the least amount of shade surrounding them, that's definitely a priority. But then I think also in terms of the age of the playground equipment, we want to look and see, you know, if a playground equipment's coming up to be replaced in two years, we may not want to make that investment right now. Um, so we'd want to do stuff, you know, that coincides with upcoming playground replacements as well. Thank you. And I think... I think that's it. But yeah, please don't forget about us parents. You know, I like the trees. Oh, trees over grass. Grass is a great place to sit um, because that's kind of cooling in, its, in and of itself. If you can sit on the grass as opposed to a bench, so having trees in and amongst the grass is great to just bring a blanket out and sit on. Thank you. I look forward to 
moving this subject forward. Commissioner Munoz. Yes, again, thank you so much for your time. I agree with my colleague, almost everything you said was perfect, right on target, but shade trees in the right places, location, that comes with the designer, thinking about that ahead of time. And then combination, I think it's appropriate. And then thinking about the parents and grandparents that sit with their, their and watch their kids play is very, <laughs> you know, we all have kids or had kids that were out there playing and we're watching basically, you know, so good point about that too. So shade with the, that in mind for the visitor. And then uh, again, combination. And then we have to really be patient with, with shade. It has to be a living, breathing uh, mechanism where it will grow over time. And now we realize that at $5,000 price tag we have for trees that are huge, you, like say $5,000, you can buy 10 of those trees that are smaller size, knowing in advance that they will get bigger. And then as we grow from parents to grandparents, we will be able to realize and accept and fall in love with that shade over time. You know, and, and I believe that kids react to the way we, we react as adults, you know, always. And so when we react positively to that environment, that shade, that fun, then it, it'll be a winning proposition, I think. But right on target on that. So anyway, great job again for such a great presentation. And we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I had a couple of comments. Um, the shade structure only option where you had the uh, bids out on Lincoln Park and Mountain Gate Park um, and Village Park. In my experience, I have never seen a park covered in that manner. Um, I think it's wholly inappropriate um, for what we've done. We've invested in this great playground equipment and then to cover it with a tent doesn't make any sense at all. And um, I will say that given my experience, um, my mom lives in Summerlin in Las Vegas, and I took my kids there like year-round school. Like every three months, we'd go up there. And uh, Las Vegas and Henderson have an amazing park system, something California does not have by the way that they invest in their parks. They have large playground structures, large play areas, and they manage to keep them covered. And they do this in a way that makes perfect sense. And it's not this structure that I see in this mock-up. I would not want to see that at a park. I don't think it's appropriate. I have seen large parks and playground equipment be fully covered. Um, and it lo they look similar to what we have with the broken up pieces, but instead what they do is, it's like large triangles staggered up and down across everything. So there's space between the shade and so it doesn't feel like it's closed up. It's not leaving gaps between shade structures where two triangles leave a gap like we have in our pictures for the shade, for the sun to come in on the equipment. Instead, they've staggered it vertically. And it doesn't appear when you drive by these playgrounds in these parks, they don't feel closed up. Um, and, it, and it looks like, to me, it would make sense maintenance-wise because if one of the shade sails breaks or rips, you're only replacing that portion. Um, and I could see why that would make sense. I think I prefer that type of style. I don't see that here in this, um, in the mock-ups. Um, and I know that we have in place that very limited look at that. The other piece that I noticed, which was kind of alarming, which was how closely related our temperature, temperatures and sunny days are to actually to Las Vegas. Um, which is extremely hot, but it's like, they're always taking in consideration shade for the spectators of the playground, the parents. And being that water is an issue, it's, they're not using trees to provide shade. Also the trees they have don't have a lot of leaves on them. We have the same issue. We don't necessarily aren't gonna be able to put a, a, tray that, a tree that's gonna provide a lot of shade by a bench for a parent. If we have those established maple trees or oak trees, we have them in much older parks. And to start in a park and say, oh, we're gonna put a tree here and hopefully that'll provide some shade. I, I personally don't think that that's that great of an option. I do like the idea that they're providing shade using a structure for their benches as well. I would like to see like partially on both. If there was a way to talk about which parks need shade over benches, existing and which parks need partial shade over structures. It kind of changes the conversation about 
how fast we want to do this, the amount of money that is going to be spent. So I think I would need more in that direction. Um, I think of like Kellogg Park, for instance. You know, it's got a lot of trees there. It's a fairly cool park. Gets a great breeze. Um, that equipment is not covered but the trees provide shade and I was never hot there, you know, sitting in the benches because the benches have a lot of shade from those trees. But if we go to another park, we don't have that option and you're trying to grow a tree. As, as you, you pointed out, we can start with smaller trees, but then we have to grow them. And I'm just questioning even if that provides enough shade at all. So I think I would need a little more information from you to be able to talk about priorities and replacement time. I think it makes sense to put the shade structures in as the new playgrounds come up, right? Um, you wouldn't want to put a shade structure in and then take out this old play equipment. That doesn't make sense to me. But the parks that we have replaced, you know, we're Mountain Gate Park. We're putting this, um, you know, the great woolly mammoth and this feature that's going to draw a lot of people. And if you canopy that to death, you know, you lose the vision. Um, and I was looking on my phone of pictures of, I was trying to pull up pictures of parks in, in Vegas that I have where my kids were playing. And um, I couldn't, you know, the, the features that they have in these parks really are outstanding. They do some outstanding stuff and they're not hiding it. The, the shade sale does not take away from what they have put there. And I think that keeping that aesthetic and that look is gonna be very important. So to me, I didn't find a mock-up on here that really paid homage to the fact that we've done some great playground replacements in Santana, Lincoln, and now Mountain Gate, and we wanna put shade over them, but we want to keep with that feel and that aesthetic. Um, I think Lincoln Park has enough trees that you don't need to shade the benches, for example. So what would the cost of that going out to, to shade the equipment? It's like, I'm not sure I can give you the recommendation without a little bit more information. Um, I might need more of a breakdown park by park um, if you want a recommendation on change out time. Um, but like I said, my, my inkling is towards what the other commissioners echoed, which is you know, the, the flowing partial shade, but also we need to look at shading some of those benches. And thank you for that feedback. When, when I worked with the uh, consultant for the shade structure, that's definitely an option is having that, that tiered type of a structure. Um, there's a variety that are out there. In this case, we were looking for what's the maximum coverage um, we can definitely research the other options. The, one of the things that he stated was that some of the triangle options, because of the, the points that are under tension, they don't tend to last as long as, as these types of structures. So that's what we're going for as well, was kind of some durability. But I can definitely look into that for uh, the different type of option, because I think that plays into, yeah, we don't want this cave. You know, we have this great equipment. Uh, Mountain Gate you know, is a beautiful park, and, and the equipment there that's gone in really enhances that. It kind of echoes that, you know, that nature and, and the trees and, and that woodsy type of a feel. So we want to enhance that, not overpower it. So uh, I, I understand we can get some more information on that. For you. Okay, thank you. But thank you for the report. I mean, I think it's great that we're moving forward with um, looking at shade structures. We know that the community wants that. Um, it's, you know, I'm just sad that my kids are all grown up and we, I can't, you know, don't get to grandkids. Oh, no, let's not. They're too, if you do that. Okay, once we have more shade, the grandkids. Hopefully that will be, the shade will come up way, way before that. <laughs> all right, so if that's all the discussion and I didn't have any uh, speaker cards from the public come up on this item, if you're, we are done here, we can move on to the next which is our consent calendar, which is our developer impact fee, which is just a receive and file. Uh, I can't remember. I don't think we take a vote on that. Do you have any comments or questions? I, I do have a question, and this is just because, you know, I'm pretty new at this. Um, just taking a look through that, there are these recurring budgets year every year, aquatic improvement, park improvement. You know, one is 100,000-ish every year and the other is three million ish every year. What goes into those in general? Well, I would suggest that you rewatch the meeting and 
um, because the staff that we need to talk about that is not really here. But if you rewatch last year's meeting, we really got into that. And I can't off the top of my head tell you which month and all that happened. But we really got into it because we wanted to figure out, I was really looking at multiple documents, trying to pull it all together. And um, we had a great presentation from the finance department. So that is there and we can, you know, we can get, the staff can get you the reports and anything if it's not available online. So I would suggest starting there and then come back because even I would have to pull all that out to explain it to you. Fair enough. <laughs> you know, and that would, we, yeah, that wouldn't go well. Yeah, all I right. know you. Yeah. Homework. <laughs> Homework. Thank you. Yeah. I, I would suggest maybe doing that. Um, all right. So we can move on to the next item, which would be our commissioner's reports and comments. Would you like to go first, Commissioner Olson? Uh, I don't actually have any reports or comments uh, other than what I've already reported and commented on uh, this evening. Commissioner Munoz. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, a variety of things. Uh, earlier I talked about uh, people coming to our city to see what we have. And two things here. We had the OBC Theater, which if you go to any of those events, fantastic. I mean, they're just uh, amazing. Here in Corona, who knew? And secondly would be the Corona Philharmonic, which they had there last week in a major event. And because of COVID, they were unable to do anything last year. But this year they hit it. And it was fantastic. People walked away just quite amazed by what they heard, what they saw, and just the spirit was there alive. And then it's been a while since we got together, but the dog park here, Griffin Park, what a fantastic place to go to if we, with your dog. If you have a dog, even if you don't have a dog, just go there you know, walk around and see a good place for dogs to run around and be dogs, basically. You know, in fact, I forget who brought the dog that day, but he christened the park this first day he was there. I forget who that was, and name was it? Yes. Uh, next, um, I'd like to applaud the city for the actual tree replacement here in town. Uh, they're doing a superb job. Just, I'd like to know, um, at a separate meeting, of course, uh, the actual tree selection, if I could. Uh, but other than that, uh, that's, I still applaud the city for doing what they're doing. And uh, last, I'd be like to applaud the city's continued effort in water conservation. They're transforming our medians from grass uh, or weeds into actual drought tolerant plant material, which is pretty nice to see. Uh, using smart irrigation, again, saving water, saving the city, uh, the community uh, money, and also using a lot of boulders carefully placed with trees and shrubs and, and de decomposed granite. So, again, I applaud the city for doing that. And then park sites, too, are even emulating that style and moving forward to uh, turf reduction. So, and that's good, too, because, you know, we have, let's say, five acres of grass. It's, you know, green waste when you mow the grass, you know, a lot of water being wasted because watered maybe at the wrong time. It's watered in the daytime, you know, between off hours versus, versus at nighttime. So, you know, the thought pattern there that we're all looking into, even our own backyards and front yards that we could copy and cannibalize the idea and use it for the improvement of our parks in, in, in Corona. So, again, I applaud the city for doing that. And last, I guess, last, I'd like to applaud the, you know, earlier today with the city representatives on the park we're doing a, project we're doing here in the west end of town. And I want to say every person I've met so far from the city staff-wise has been so nice. And then, I mean, and I'm just Tom Munoz, the landscape architect, nobody. And so they, and they're just they're willing to help you out, you know, they go the extra mile. So that seems to be every employee is doing that. This, you know, that's a, I mean, that's what they do. So we've hired the right people. <laughs> so again, I applaud the city. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to give the thanks and kudos to the staff for all the work that went into bringing the wall that heals here. So congratulations. Job well done. Unfortunately, I couldn't see it, but um, I was looking forward to it. But I, I think it meant a lot to the community, and I think that it touched a lot of people. So kudos to you. That is a really just, just kind of a hallmark deal for you guys, and it took years to get it here. So. Thank you. I wanted to say thank you. And I also wanted to thank the staff that I think we've done um, just a great amount of improvement on the 
cleanups that we're having at the parks and around in the community. We're back to doing that, which is wonderful. There's advance notice. Uh, we've targeted that, we like the skate park is targeted for the kids to help to take ownership in our parks. So we're starting to focus on that, taking ownership of your community and cleaning your community. And I know that we're gonna extend that into the master plan process and the trails plan. It will be, you know, as a community, we need to own these trails and parks and really take pride in them, pride in ownership, and um, get involved, get involved with keeping it going. And I think that, you know, that's the part where, you know, when we get, comments and letters from the public, I'm always anxious to find a way that they could possibly help us. So when they write me, I'm always kind of looking for what opportunity do we have to get them involved. And what I see over the time that I've been here that we are expanding that opportunity. So I wanted to thank you for doing that. And it's quite an improvement. So let's just keep it going. And, and hopefully with the park rangers coming on board and we've got a volunteer coordinator in place, these pieces are integral to bringing our community to, to really improve our park system. It won't just be, you know, the commission trying to ferret out which drinking fountain is the best. <laughs> so I wanted to thank you for that. And um, that just concludes my comments for the evening. So I think we are complete here. If, if there are any announcements left to make, none. Okay, then we will consider this meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.